Jacksonians succeeded where the Jeffersonians failed because of greater tenacity, refusing to work with the opposition, the increased influence of free market thought, and tactic cooperation with free market British politicians. Critically, they triumphed with the executive branch, morphing the office from a corrupt shield into an anti-crony sword. That is the words of Dr. Patrick Newman joining me once again here on Liberty versus Power. Again, if you have not gotten your copy yet of Cronyism, you can get a, a discount in the Mesa store with the LVP as the code. Patrick, this is a fun episode today. We, we have made it to the Jacksonian era. And I guess starting off, you know, one of the things I think is interesting about Jackson is that he is a figure that, you know, while he has been, uh, you know, he, he's seen as politically incorrect in today's world, once upon a time, um, you had various different political factions trying to present themselves as continuations of a Jacksonian democracy. Uh, so wh what do you think of that term Jacksonian democracy? What does it mean to you? Um, because again, it's a very interesting discourse out there within uh, historical circles. Yeah. So first of all, thanks. Thanks, though. Uh, glad to be on again and, and, and talking uh, on this uh, on this podcast. Second, I'm glad you mentioned the book. And for those of you watching the video, you might have seen me searching around. I've always wanted to have a copy of the book to actually show on the screen like though. And of course, I said I have it and then I guess I left it on the other chair. And so now I don't. So again, for this episode, I still don't have uh, the, 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 the book. So but anyway, uh, with, with that um, uh, m m extraneous uh, uh, material aside, uh, you know, what's Jacksonian democracy? So as you mentioned, uh, Andrew Jackson is an extremely controversial president, uh, but he's also someone who's left a profound legacy um, in, you know, for, in terms of the presidency, in terms of democracy, in terms of the United States government. Uh, even regarding uh, you know, central banking, uh, monetary laissez-faire, and so on. Uh, when a lot of people think of Andrew Jackson, they think of at least initially the founding of the Democrat Party, which relates to the Jacksonian Democrat. Well, what exactly was a Jacksonian uh, Democrat or Jacksonian democracy? Well, Jacksonian democracy was democracy by the average person. So the uh, in that time at the average, the the white white male. Okay, uh, they. It was the belief that they should have the ability to vote and that their voting is actually a way of enacting change. OK, so that's in particularly what a Jacksonian Democrat refers to in in particular it refers to the idea that the the people are going to choose the president. So the people will decide who the president will be, not necessarily the state legislatures or Congress, right, which is seen as uh, very corrupt. Uh, you know, and the Electoral College was a shield blocking uh, the will of the people, but it was the people who could actually change the system and in re particular reform the system. Because even though most people, when they discuss Jacksonian democracy, uh, they mainly focus on the actual suffrage and in, in, in question of voting. They they don't necessarily talk about how, by and large, this suffrage and this voting was directed towards reducing cronyism, decreasing the government's involvement in the economy and trying to bring about laissez-faire. So Jacksonian democracy is really a different strategy for trying to achieve laissez-faire uh, at the state and federal level. And one of the things I think is interesting, again, some of the different narratives out there about, you know, what are some of the forces that be stirring, you know, this this political change is that, you know, for one, like they're really much I think there there was sort of a backlash, right, to, you know, we, we saw this play out with with obviously the motivations of the old Republicans, the, the Martin Van Buren's out there that were trying to reclaim kind of those Jeffersonian ideals. But but also you had a tremendous amount of change happening to the life of your average American. Um, and I, I know uh, Harry Watson in uh, his book Liberty and Power, he talks uh, about um, he calls it the market revolution and how some there were some you know, kind of materialistic changes going on in terms of of commercial activity, but but also the dynamic in which ideas were easier to uh, circulate within smaller towns, in particular. Um, you had you know growing. You know, uh, uh, strengthening of, of the post office system, um, you know, kind of you know, during the early days of the government, things like that, so that some of these smaller towns had an opportunity to play a more active role in terms of political discourse. 
you, is this a period with less gate, gatekeepers? You know, it, is the, the concept of sort of the, the natural elites, is that changing in, during this period? And, and, you know, how much of that is perhaps a backlash to kind of this corruptive class um, that was able to take over the old Jeffersonian party? Yeah. So that's a that, that, that's a great it's a great point you make. I would say that it is you know the the the, the there there are less gatekeepers so to speak in 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 this era, okay? The people are voting uh, more often there's less policies or at least less uh, you know on the terms of presidential elections state legislatures are deciding uh, the electors less and less technology is very different you've got newspapers people are reading more uh, they're able to you know to, to, to learn about information and also articulate it in in their own newspapers or or little asides. I, I always I mentioned this, I think, before that newspapers back in the day, they would always have columns of just, you know, almost letters to the editor, but they were short, like one sentence, two sentence, little tweets, basically, uh, that people would put in about various information. And so these newspapers, some of which would cycle, you know, uh, maybe twice a day or something you would get. It was it was the tweets of tweets of the era of ye old Jacksonian uh, tweets. And there, it was seen, okay, the people have abilities uh, that they didn't have before. They have more uh, freedom, at least to try to do what they want, to exercise their ideas, to learn about ideas. So yeah, the, the Jacksonian era, it was a uh, reaction against the natural elites. I wouldn't say it was a reaction against elites per se, but it was a reaction against the, the elites entrenched in the government. One of the things the Jacksonians were very big on was rotation in office. So they thought that, all right, you know, the office is not like a privilege that uh, people have. So if you're serving in, in government as a politician or bureaucrat, doesn't mean that you're just allowed to keep serving um, in that position as long as you want, you know, on the taxpayer dime. They wanted to circulate elites. So they wanted natural elites. I guess you could say the natural elites are those created by the market, not those artificially created by government uh, fiat. Yeah, that's one point that you highlight um, within the book. Um, you've got a great quote here. Um, uh, you know, that, that you talked about how, how Washington had turned into a swamp and many officials viewed um, you know, th their titles as property rights that they could bequeath to their sons. I mean, this is very much almost like a European aristocracy sort of dynamic that it would make sense that would have emerged during this uniparty system. Um, you know, you, you don't have those those interparty dynamics at play. And of course, here you, you've brought conflict back to politics. And, and you, you highlight how um, uh, between the Washington administration and the Quincy Adams administration, a, a total of 213 officials had been uh, fired during that time. Within the Jacksonian administration, over 250 uh, were terminated. Uh, again, I, I think this goes into, again, that dynamic where there is virtue within that sort of partisan process of you know, creating itself a, a bit of a check on this, this entrenched bureaucracy involved here. Really, I mean, this, this, this was going after the deep state of that era. Um, and then, then also as well, not only the, the, the changeover within these official titles, uh, but can you talk a little bit about that di dynamic of uh, Jackson's having a, a kitchen cabinet different than the official you know, you know, cabinet administrators of the past? Some of these different dynamics, again, like the, the, the way that Jackson was going about these things. Um, in, in fact, to build on that still, and I know you mentioned in the past how one of the differences that Patrick Henry had with Thomas Jefferson was a belief in the power of the executive branch within this. I mean, all, all of this kind of goes to this much larger point, right, of you know, the role of the executive branch. You know, Jackson himself seeing himself as the embodiment truly of American democracy, the true representative of the people. Again, this is a very dynamic, even if the, the, the underlying ideology you're perhaps very similar to the old Republicans, you know, the, the, the ideals of the Jeffersonian era. There really is a, a very different view structurally of how this government is should operate and does operate during this period. 
Oh, yeah. So um, in terms of the removals, the Jacksonians were very big on removals, making sure, trying to institute some form of the old anti-federalist rotation office. They did not want politicians and bureaucrats remaining comfortably uh, positioned in their uh, in, 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 in their uh, in, in their jobs. OK, and this was to prevent a, an entrenched uh, bureaucracy, an entrenched sort of oligarchy from taking place. Uh, Jefferson had wanted to do that. Jefferson had failed. Uh, he only removed a fraction of the people who some of his more radical supporters wanted him to remove. Jackson went much further. OK, so Jackson was the, 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 the idea of uh, rotation office, which was deridingly referred to as the spoil system, is actually a great reform, a great anti crony reform, precisely because it prevents a bureaucracy from being developed. Um, Jackson also had sort of informal advisors, if you will. He rotated his cabinet, not just through frequent rotations of his actual cabinet, but actually by using a different cabinet. Uh, the so-called kitchen cabinet of his informal advisors who, you know, he, they, they, they would speak, um, you know, they, you know, in the, they, he, he let them into the back of the white house and they, they talk shop and all of that. And uh, they would be the ones really kind of directing Jackson's uh, program. And they would sort of have less, um, uh, they would, there, there'd be less oversight on them as opposed to the traditional cabinet, which Congress had a say in. Okay. Congress at least has to approve the people running the government cabinets, right? The president can nominate them. The Senate has to confirm them. And the Jacksonians' big enemy at this point was Congress. It was always the legislature because unlike the Jeffersonian era of Thomas Jefferson uh, and, you know, of, in, you know, of, in, of the anti-federalists beforehand, the Jacksonians realized that basically Congress is actually the enemy. You can't achieve reform through Congress because of the constant pressure for elections uh, and really just the constant pressure for uh, privileges. OK, so without rotation in office and with all this unlimited government power, Congress is going to quickly become uh, actually the, 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 the uh, proponent of cronyism. It's going to propel it rather than stop it. So the Jacksonians. Uh, many of them were, you know, strict constructionists. They were pre pre people who were previously very anti-executive power. They sort of turned to the executive now as their savior. And this is a brilliant strategy. This is why I kind of think Patrick Henry was sort of on the mark in his uh, some of his earlier kind of splits with Jefferson, whether or not Henry had really developed these ideas uh, as far as, as as some people later is, 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 is probably uh, unlikely. But he at least had an inkling of this is that, well, the executive, you, you know, it's this one guy who can if you got the right person, he can sort of get stuff done because the Jacksonian said, all right, particularly by using the veto transforming the presidential veto into a tool that can actually strike down cronyism. The president has the ability to decide whether legislation is good. And uh, if it's constitutional, the uh, presidency can actually reform the government. OK, and this is a very novel idea. It was very controversial. And this is really, I would say, probably Jackson's most lasting impact, at least just you turning the presidential veto into something that uh, people regularly use. It's no longer really the anti-crony um, uh, uh, sword that the Jacksonians hope for, but it still is reasonably, the realistically, the only way you could get something done. If we, ever a Ron Paul candidate were to become president, the only way you could actually achieve any reform is not through Congress, but just through the veto. So the Jacksonians were very, very uh, smart in, the, in their analysis of the situation. And it's something that gets neglected, which is why I think it's all the more important that we're talking about it. Uh, absolutely. And that's one of the things I think is interesting. Again, you're trying to, to pull it out to, to modern day sort of conversations, right? You have, you know, for example, you know, you know the, the interest within certain circles um, you know, that, that would argue that, uh, you know, there are structures within a, a monarchist sort of system that lends itself, you know, as, as a better defense of liberty than, than a, a democratic system and things like that. Like, within the American sense, you know, Jackson is, you know, he, he was kind of a, 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 a king figure, right? You, we, you had the Whig Party arise you know, they 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 were they're directly adopting you know this sort of framework in there, and and the reason why Jackson had this sort of power was because of his connection to your average American, you know, 
impacted by the political system, and this willingness to assert executive authority. You know, there's been, uh, uh, you know, there, there's this constant kind of dynamic in, in conversations, not only within libertarian circles, but kind of the right more broadly. Um, back in the day, there was uh, you know, the hope that, uh, you know, someone like a Ronald Reagan could come in and be sort of a, a unilateral executive sort of figure and, and you know, impose onto, you know, the, the post uh, Great Society style federal government that, that you know, sprung up. Um, you know, try to sort of restore it down to, I don't know, post FDR era sort of, you know, framing and things like that. It, it obviously didn't happen. Um, whereas some people would say, okay, well, it, it's more important to have a, a greater respect for Congress that, that, that you know, the, the, the danger comes in putting too much power within the executive branch. You know, I, I think historically, again, comparing and contrasting, the, say, the, the Jeffersonian style of governing with the Jacksonian style. This is a this is a, a period of history where you can really see, I think, the differences in these models. And again, part of that, you know, one of the advantages the Jacksonians had is not only did you have the force of personality of, of Jackson the figure, but you had all of these side individual leaders trying to influence policy. You know, they, they, they didn't let him sort of rest on his laurels, right? You know, these are individuals surrounding Jackson with an agenda to push. And so can you talk a little bit about the, the influence of that kitchen cabinet in, in you know, contrasted to some of the views of the official cabinet? Um, you know, the, the official Treasury Secretary was uh, uh, Louis McLean. His views on this stuff you know, differed from significantly from what a, a William Gouge uh, uh, and some of the other you know, you know, ideological Jacksonians believed in how to go about dealing with you know, the second bank of the United States or some of these other economic matters. Yeah. So the, J Jackson, when I, when I think I'm glad you, you referenced the Jeffersonians because I think the, 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 the Jacksonian succeeded, as you mentioned in the quote at the beginning of the episode, the Jacksonian succeeded where the Jeffersonians failed partially because they used a different strategy. They decided to concentrate their efforts through the executive rather than through Congress per se, though Jackson did have many helpful uh, you know, people who were uh, supporting him in Congress, right? But it was through the executive veto. It was through um, the rotation in office, enforcing that, et cetera, that the Jacksonians were actually able to accomplish meaningful reform, okay? Now, this led to problems because increasing the power of the presidency increases the uh, corruptibility of the presidency, which is something we'll probably, you know, we'll, we'll talk about later uh, in this podcast series. But you know, still the Jacksonians, you have to give them credit because this totally bushwhacked uh, the opposition. The National Republicans did not see this coming. They thought it would be business as usual in Congress. They were very upset that Jackson was using the veto in the way he was using it. And that's why the new, the Whig Party, right, which uh, guys like Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John Quincy Adams established, they had named it strategically in reference to the Whigs, the British Whigs uh, who fought um, you know, a, a tyranny uh, in 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 the um, in, in in their government, and they're trying to say, well, we're standing up to uh, you know an American monarch. At certain points, the Whigs actually wanted to try to get rid of the presidential veto. Uh, this was not part of their strategy. They were not prepared for this, and this is why, uh, partially, why the Jacksonians succeeded. So Jackson, you know, succeeded because he had these uh, he had this veto and he was constantly able to sort of figure out strategy by talking to his kitchen cabinet. OK, these are the guys that you mentioned, Martin Van Buren, Amos Kendall, Francis Preston, Preston Blair, uh, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri and so on. These are some of the people who were uh, very supportive of Jackson and they were always able to push him into the positions that he was naturally supportive of, which was crippling the American system. That was always the number one goal of the Jacksonians. Right. So, uh, you know, get rid of the central bank. Right. Uh, get rid of protective tariffs, pay off the debt and uh, government uh, federally supported uh, internal improvements and so on. Right. So whereas Jackson's uh, initial secretaries of the of, of the Treasury were, were, were much more um, um, you know, mild and, and moderate, like some of the people in Jefferson's cabinet, it wasn't as big of an issue because ja J Jackson would fire them. if They didn't listen to him uh, and he would also listen to his own cabinet. 
So I'm imagining Jackson going like, you're fired, right? Something like that. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, that that's uh, that we don't know that that that's lost to history, I guess. Um, but so the, 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 the central bank was was very big on Jackson's agenda and on the kitchen cabinet agenda, because you got this central bank, right? It's the original impetus behind, rad, you know, behind radicalizing uh, the, the Jacksonians in the panic of 1819, turning many of them into supporters of hard money. So they're against fractional reserve banking. They're against government uh, support of the banking system. They're against the central bank. Are they perfectly laissez-faire? No. Do they have the perfect laissez-faire solutions? No, uh, but no one's perfect, as I'll talk about um, in, in, in a second. So they wanted to get rid of, of the central bank, right? So this really, the Jackson's first administration, I think the most important and long-lasting action that he did was the so-called bank war. It was this, uh, it was this multi-year-long struggle against the hydra of corruption. The Bank of the United States, right, which which uh, various political cartoonists back in the day would would literally portray as a hydra with multiple heads and Jackson was fighting it. And I'm like, oh, isn't this great? Can't we do this for the Federal Reserve or something like that? <laughs> um, but a lot of people think that it was just based off of Jackson's personality issues with Nicholas Biddle or that Jackson just wanted to replace it with his own central bank. That's simply not true. Jackson would can another strategy of Jackson that I like. It's a little devious, but you always got to play hardball in politics. Is Jackson did intentionally lie to people and he misled <laughs> people. He misled his cabinet. He misled. Reminds me of someone else. <laughs> um, he misled his cabinet. He misled other government officials um, because he was experienced in war. He was a general, and he knows well. You have to. Uh, you want your opponents to fight in the fog of war to not really know what's going on. And for them to only belatedly figure out that, OK, Jackson's not actually listening to his cabinet. He's listening to these other guys, uh, you know, the kitchen cabinet. The other thing is what I what I mentioned earlier is that the, the, the Jacksonians didn't necessarily have a perfect route to go to complete monetary laissez faire. Some of their initial solutions kind of verged on a central bank, but this was because no one did at the time. There really weren't that many pure monetary laissez-faire theories at the time. Even the British reformers, such as the currency school, uh, had wanted to uh, you know, uh, reform their system by uh, using government intervention or centralizing the ability to issue notes in, in the Bank of England, et cetera. Guys like uh, David Ricardo, John Baptiste Say, and, and so on had sort of developed rudimentary ideas like this. But the, 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 the central point remains uncontested. It's that Jackson wanted to bring uh, the economy closer to laissez-faire. This includes money. And his major goal was getting rid or weakening the second bank of the United States. One of my favorite books out there that really goes to the heart of kind of the energizing spirit of the Jacksonians, the Jacksonian persuasion. And uh, in the introduction, they, they highlight, again, just you know, the degree to which bank issues really were kind of a key mobilizing factor here. Um, you know, bro broadly speaking, the Jacksonians blamed the bank for transgressions committed by the people of their era against the political, social, and economic values of the old republic. The bank carried the bad seed of Hamilton's first monster, matured all the old evils, and created some new ones. To the bank's influence, Jacksonians traced constitutional impiety, uh, consolidated national power, aristocratic privilege, and plutocratic corruption, social inequality, impersonal and intangible business relationships, economic instability, perpetual debt, and taxes, all issued from the same source. I mean, again, you know, they, they really touched right there on the, you know, they had their finger on the pulse of the, just the incredibly corruptive influence of this central bank. And as we have seen throughout these, you know, doing this podcast time and time again, we saw the role that the central bank and the financiers around it were, were able to corrupt, you know, otherwise good Jeffersonians, otherwise, you know, strict constitutionalists, uh, utilizing the powers that they had from this institution. And the, fa and, and the fact that you actually had someone elected to this position with the support of the people willing to then stand up and do something about it. You know, that is something that is very rare <laughs> throughout political history generally, right? And and this is this is what I think gives Jackson that that you know this is why he lasts. It's because he was someone who was an imperfect individual um in, in a variety of different ways. 
but he set up to accomplish one big thing. And though the execution may not be perfect, he accomplished that one big thing. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's something to be learned from that. Um, that aside, can, can you touch on just a little bit, um, uh, a little bit, one of the things I think is interesting is, is you brought up this, this currency school and, you know, you mentioned in, in the, uh, the opening quote there about the role of British politicians. One of the other, I think, interesting aspects of this era is, you know, we've talked in episodes past about the influence of Adam Smith. Um, you know, there, there really much was this larger populist free market laissez-faire defense going on within the Anglosphere. Um, there's a great book on this uh, by Robert Kelly, The Transatlantic Persuasion, um, that highlights the political cooperation of, you know, these sort of, uh, you know, laissez-faire politicians within England, within Canada, within America, uh, both pre and post civil war. Um, can you talk just a little bit about, again, this, this, the, the influence, not only of these, you know, the, the, the politicalization of that Adam Smith laissez-faire sort of agenda. Um, but also can you t- touch on just a little bit, um, what, what separated the currency school and, and contrasted to some other economic disciplines out there. I, I know um, uh, uh, Dr. Just, uh, Dr. Salerno has talked about how, how you know, Mises was a, uh, a currency school, free banker. Um, you know, the, there, there's interest amongst the economists around uh, Jackson, including Googe and others, who are also sympathetic to this sort of free banking tradition um, that, that we could also place Mises in. Uh, can you just talk about you know, these people as sort of proto-Austrians in a way, on uh, not only their understanding of how free markets work, but in, in particular, you know, this, this monetary focus. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the reasons why the Jacksonians were successful is because there was a simultaneous free market movement going on in Great Britain, okay? Uh, this includes the hard money currency school, Okay, it includes the um, uh, Richard Cobden and John Bright uh, fighting to lower tariffs. All right, this was the Smithian movement. It really started to blossom this idea of laissez faire, uh, based off the ideas of Adam Smith, uh, then continued on through guys like David Ricardo, John Baptiste Say, et cetera. Not necessarily talking about the theoretical differences between them. Rothbard's done a good job of. Of, of doing that, but just the broader sort of th- free market thrust uh, was really starting to develop uh, in the United States and in Great Britain in the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s. So Great Britain, uh, having printed a bunch of money in the War of 1812, or not the War of 1812, excuse me, the Napoleonic Wars, though they also participated in the War of 1812, uh, had to deal with uh, some sort of similar uh, monetary questions that r- really started to invigorate uh, some proponents of the gold standard and opponents of fractional reserve banking. Basically, why did prices rise so much during this war? Some people said it was the increase in the money supply. Other people said that it was transitory supply shocks. <laughs> Okay, it wasn't necessarily the price of used cars, but it was agricultural reasons, uh, you know, uh, war disruption, speculation on the exchange, uh, uh, on the foreign exchange markets, and so on. This then continued, these debates continued to the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, when the new opposing camps were either the currency school uh, or the banking school. And basically, the currency school argued that. Um, they, they had the current, they basically argued what was known as the currency principle, which was that banks should adhere to a, what was known, what's known as a marginal, uh, hundred percent reserve requirement. So for any additional issuance of bank notes and deposits, they needed to be backed by gold. Okay. So changes in the money supply should reflect changes in the supply of gold. That's, that's what they argued. All right. Uh, the banking school was much more that the banking system needed to respond to the so, so-called needs of trade. OK, uh, that necessarily the, the crises weren't necessarily due to monetary phenomenon. 
Uh, they could be due to things like over speculation and changes in expectations and, and, and so on. Right. So Mises and Rothbard were always very pro currency school. Mises has argued that uh, he had developed many of his ideas regarding Austrian business cycle theory from the monetary theory of the currency school and so on. Uh, all of this is would make for great discussion in an economic theory podcast. What matters for us is that, well, the Jacksonians also um, adhered to the currency school. Many of the Jacksonians were influenced by the currency school and Jacksonians also influenced some members of the currency school. Jacksonian economists, in many ways, they went beyond the currency school. This is something uh, Mises and Rothbard mentioned, uh, particularly because one major, really the major flaw of the currency school was that they did not recognize that bank deposits were also uh, part of the money supply. OK, so they wanted uh, they basically concentrate on bank notes. Many Jacksonian economists had recognized that bank deposits are very uh, you know, similar to bank notes and they also should be included in the money supply. So the currency school played an important role in really fostering and continuing this hard money, uh, this hard money sentiment in the United States. All right. And it's 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 something that I think doesn't really get. Uh, recognized as much that sometimes people think that the Jacksonians were sort of uh, separate from the British or they were just doing their own things and that, well, it was really all just secretly about slavery or whatever. When no, you can actually disprove this by looking at who their allies were. And these were individuals in Great Britain um, who were really trying to bring about their own version of free market reform. So the Jacksonian movement in many ways is a Smithian movement, okay, influenced by the ideas of Adam Smith. Robert Kelly and the transatlantic persuasion uh, makes this case very convincingly, and I agree with him in my book, Cronyism. And that's one of the other slurs that is kind of gets thrown around. It's like, oh, well, you know, the Jacksonians were just putting in a whole bunch of country bumpkins that were unqualified for the position. And, you know, you know it, 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 whereas like, no, like there, there very much was a very you know, nuanced and, and deep understanding here of what is going on, which I, I think is a pre, which I appreciate. So, you know, one now, now we talked a little bit about okay, they, they, they've got this critique, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out the solutions. Can you talk about the role of the independent treasury as you know, one of you know, what they see as a solution to uh, the, the dangers of the second bank of the United States? And, and you know, what, what is their agenda here with in trying to instill an independent treasury as an answer to um, kind of reining back in this Hamiltonian monster? Yeah, so the independent treasury is an idea that actually goes be uh, you know it's it's older than the the Jacksonians. It really originated with uh, Thomas Jefferson and and even John Randolph um, and and John Taylor. So this is in the 1790s, uh, early 1800s. Thomas Jefferson and he had a famous I think it was in 1792 sort of a private uh, memorandum, a, a note of agenda. Uh, and one of the things he mentioned was he wanted to make the uh, treasury deal only in specie. Okay. So it would accept only specie as payments, and it would also spend out only specie in its expenditures. The idea here was to make the treasury independent from the banking system. Because starting with the first bank of the United States, the government stored most of its money at that institution. And this was seen as an enormous subsidy because the bank now had a huge amount of reserves that it could use to make, you know, make loans and, and, do, and do other sorts of business. Right. It was a corrupting influence. Many state banks or some state banks initially, they wanted to kill that bank. Um, because they wanted some of that, that they wanted that subsidy. This continued in the uh, second bank of the United States, where the government would um, also hold its money at that institution. And if they didn't have they'll have the second, the, the central bank, uh, defenders of the central bank said, well, you're just going to keep money in state banks, which will sort of spread out the problem. This is something the Jacksonians initially did. Uh, reg you know, they, they, they regretted it. They, they, they knew it was a second best solution, but they wanted to institute this old Jeffersonian Randolph uh, proposal to separate the government from the banking system because it was thought that if the government is no longer accepting bank notes um, in, in, for, for payments, it's no longer subsidizing any institution. It's no longer giving any special privileges to any institution by accepting their notes 
or by storing money at uh, the you know at, at at a large bank, right? So this was a huge cornerstone of the Jacksonian system. It was this independent treasury. You you sunder the the crony government bank alliance, okay? And this was something uh, William Goge. Uh, initially um, proposed in the Jacksonian administration. It took a little bit for it to gain traction. Uh, eventually, Martin Van Buren uh, did institute the independent treasury uh, in 1840. And of course, he signed it on July 4th, which I think uh, you know means something, all right? Because that means, in my opinion, it's just as important as the Declaration of Independence. Well, before we had the success of Martin Van Buren and signing that off entirely, um, the fight back in this bank war, I think, is interesting, um, particularly for the topic of this podcast. Um, you, you go into details about uh, you know, just the, 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 the tricks used by Nicholas Biddle uh, to maintain his power. Um, surprise, surprise. A lot of it has to do with bribery, has to do with loans. Um, you highlight various uh, legislators that all of a sudden, oh, you get a, you know, James Webb gets a fifteen thousand dollar loan, and surprise, surprise, they end up being critics of Jackson's handling here. Um, you also uh, point out how the American Quarterly Review, um, which is an academic journal uh, whose owner was a benefactor of the bank, you know, then became one of the chief. Uh, propaganda outlets in defense of the bank, which again sounds exactly <laughs> like, like you know academic journals in America today, uh, where the majority of grants are backed by the Federal Reserve. And surprise, surprise! The bias of the academic literature towards central banking uh, ends up uh, going quite nicely there. Um, you know, talk a little bit more about the the opposition here. That you know, h- how does Bill respond? to, you know, as soon as he realizes that Jackson is, is here playing for keeps, what, what is the pushback from uh, Biddle and the, the rest of the cronies of the bank? Yeah, so Biddle's upset about this because Biddle thought that Jackson actually wouldn't attack the bank. Biddle had initially voted for Jackson. Uh, Biddle thought that, well, this would be, you know, this is one way of appeasing him. Uh, we can just continue sort of business as usual. He wasn't happy when Jackson had started to make comments in some of his presidential speeches criticizing the bank, saying that much of the public didn't like the bank, sort of suggesting reforms along the line of the independent treasury and so on. So Biddle was very much against this. And he started to, as you mentioned, he started to flex his muscles, use the corrupting tentacles of the Hydra. Okay, so he started to uh, send pro banking committee, uh, pro banking information to important politicians on the relevant uh, committees. He uh, enlisted the help of academic journals, uh, which, as you mentioned, received loans from the bank to defend the bank. And he started lending money to politicians uh, as well as uh, you know, creating his own propaganda material. And this is the big issue a lot of people had with the bank. It's that, well, it could. Uh, recruit newspapers, it could recruit politicians, it could recruit businesses by giving them money. It literally has the power to create money. So you're, you're, you're sort of creating this corrupt partnership, right? Because uh, a newspaper might be very pro-bank, central banking, not because it's the best thing for the country, but simply because it's getting money from the bank. OK, this is this is an obvious conflict of interest that really uh, the Jacksonians were, were were not OK with. So Biddle is uh, busy doing all of this. He's trying to corrupt the relevant uh, officials. Jackson is not bending. So what Biddle decides to do is using uh, a little prodding from Henry Clay, he basically pushes for an early recharter at the end of um, 1831, early 1832. And Henry Clay's rationale was this. He said, look, uh, Biddle, if you push for the recharter and Jackson sides, you know, signs the recharter, he's going to look very weak. OK, uh, and because I'm going to be the nominee for the, the for the Whigs in the 1832 presidential election, I'll look really good and then I'll win. His vice presidential candidate was someone who previously worked for the bank. So he's very pro central banking. OK, and Clay says that, well, if Jackson actually is stupid enough to veto the bank, then I'll win the election anyway, because the people will be upset. 
So uh, this is really when the bank war sort of kicked into its its high you know its its high gear it reached its climax when the Whigs were were pushing for Jackson to actually stand up uh you know uh, the, you know to stand up for his principles and he did this he he ended up uh, vetoing the bank. Uh, and he wrote a fantastic bank veto, and he ended up winning the election. So uh, he won out pretty well. He did but pretty he, good he, for himself. Yeah, and and he also he recognized that even though that the veto prevented the rechartering of the bank early, it did not stop the bank entirely. Uh, so he's got this great quote: um, "You know, this, the Hydra is only sc- uh, scotched, not dead." And again, just the 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 the, the way the bank is portrayed during this period as, as a hydra, as a monster, you know, the, all of the, the great political cartoons of this era, again, just the degree to which this money issue, this central banking issue, w- 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 so animated uh, uh, you know, energy in politics. Again, this is something that I think is so underappreciated uh, today. I mean, if, you know, if we're in a populist age, I mean, you know, the Jacksonians show that, you know, this is something, because again, ultimately it goes, again, it goes directly to the corruption of civic virtue. And, mm-hmm. and that's something that's just, it's, it's timeless uh, here. And it's just, there's so much good stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love how you mentioned that quote, because one, I love that he wrote the congressman, James K. Polk. So he's the little hickory, old hickory writing the little hickory. And it's like the hydra of corruption is only scotch, not dead. Um, he, he also, Jackson had a great quote. He, he, he said to Van Buren one time, he was like sick. Uh, you know, he was, he was in the White House and he's like, the bank is trying to kill me. You know, but I will kill it. You know, and you're like, wow, this is this is awesome. Like, here he goes. You know, uh, he's taking off the gloves. The other thing I just wanted to mention very briefly is that Jackson's bank veto, the bank veto, you know, his 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 message is probably the best presidential document fighting against cronyism. He really makes a lot of great arguments. It's not an attack on capitalism. It's an attack on special privileges. He says, you know, the government through the bank has been favoring the rich through all sorts of, you know, through subsidies and restrictions. Uh, the poor, the middle class, they're upset about this. Uh, I need to veto this bank. It's it's a problem. Um, you know, this is based on economic and uh, strict constructionist grounds. It really was an admirable defense. And what's also important to note, this kind of ties into Jackson's use of a, an alternative cabinet, is a lot of people for a long time thought that um, his attorney general, later uh, briefly secretary of the treasury, and then finally, uh, or perhaps most infamously, uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Roger Tawney, wrote the, uh, the, the, the bank veto. But in reality, it was Amos Kendall. Okay, Amos Kendall is an economist, an economist or an economist uh, newspaper editor. Um, he is mentioned in Rothbard's History of Economic Thought uh, for developing important insights regarding uh, utility as a source of value, which I just think is a completely fascinating aside in itself that the same guy who's writing the bank veto is also doing like marginal utility analysis. I mean, that's, you can't get any better than that. I mean, what more do you want in a guy? Um, and he, along with France and Preston Blair, kind of managed the Washington Globe, or he was really kind of a, a big theoretician, um, you know, pushing for Jacksonian uh, policies, pushing Jackson to be anti-bank and so on. So you have this kitchen cabinet official really writing like this major presidential document. OK, uh, and that's that that's something important that should be highlighted because it shows how the Jacksonians had that such a deep lineup. And it was really through this through this ingenious strategy of having these front men in his cabinet do things. And then when reality it looked like they're doing things in reality, you've got uh, different people, uh, the kitchen cabinet uh, executing orders, taking, you know, carrying out plans, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it's really um, it's a it, it, it's a great it's a great way at least to try to reform the system. The other thing I think is interesting is that you highlight all of so after you have Jackson doing what he's doing, vetoing, you know, vetoing the recharting the bank, eventually getting, you know, killing the bank entirely. It, it, that that wasn't like a you know, okay. Well, the, the federal Jacksonians are doing this, and then you know, the, the the state level officials have nothing to do with the the banking and money side of things. No, that there there were leaders at various within the states and Jacksonian leaders. Uh, working on banking policy, uh, 
um, you know, trying trying to bring a, a you know a, a free banking style sort of structure to the at the state level. Um, you you mentioned uh, uh, you know a, a New York an up and pro, up and coming uh, a New Yorker named Samuel Tilden um, it, it gets gets involved in, in these areas. So there's this is not something that's mobilizing within the White House and kind of a federal only issue. This is a mobilizing issue even at the states for the Democratic Party. And can you just you know, mention you know, maybe just a little bit of some of the reforms that were attempted at that state level, even though um, you still had that issue with you know, so much bribery, um, you know, so many loans on the books from like the, the Virginia state legislature, I think you've highlighted as being particularly in debt and things like that. You know, the, the same dynamic was playing out in state capitals, not only in D.C., yeah. So on the state levels, the Jacksonians also tried to institute monetary reform. This is really particularly the most successful in New York. Right. So this is because you had guys uh, such as uh, William Leggett and William Colin Bryant. Uh, they were editors of the New York Evening Post. So this is actually a particularly laissez faire uh, and, you know, uh, laissez faire uh, periodical. Um, that William Leggett was famous for being a loco foco. We don't need to get into that, but it was just really a, a hardcore laissez-faire Jacksonian Democrat. I think a lot of people have done great work on the loco focos. Um, I think sometimes the tendency is to make it seem as the Jacksonians were not laissez-faire. I do think they're laissez-faire. Um, I think, you know, the loco focos are just even more laissez-faire than them, but there's been a lot of uh, good work done on local focus. Anthony Comegna, Larry White, and some other people have done um, have done good research on them. But the, the local focus wanted to just totally get the banking uh, system separated from the government. So they finally realized that the best way to attack charters on the bank level is not to reduce the supply of charters, but is to basically issue as many of them as possible to make the charter license valueless, right? If if everyone get, is getting a government license, then no one's getting a government license is basically the logic. It's an indirect form of deregulation. And they've uh, hit upon this insight. M Mises was very big at uh, expounding, which is that when you have laissez-faire in the banking system, banks won't engage in, uh, they won't overexpand credit because if they do, then they'll lose reserves through the adverse clearing mechanism. So Leggett and Bryant, uh, they, they realize this, they're pushing for this in New York. Um, or the Jacksonians are doing that, or they're just trying to get rid of uh, chartered banks or make the chartered banks more responsible um, and, and take away their privileges, et cetera. Um, you know, in, in, in New York and in other states, you did have the Whigs who wanted to have a system of fractional reserve banking, maybe with some uh, deregulation in the chartering system, but to really just add extra regulations by requiring banks to back their notes with government bonds, uh, by allowing banks to suspend in specie payments, um, and, and so on. And that this is what the Whigs are pushing for. So in many ways, the 1838, I think, New York Free Banking Act was kind of like a Whig coup because it had some of these government regulations. Um, but this was kind of the battle being fought on the uh, state level. The Jacksonians were trying to uh, remove government privileges to fractional reserve banking. The Whigs uh, were trying to add new privileges uh, for fractional reserve banks. Okay, so uh, the Jacksonians were not as successful on the state level, but they were still very successful because they had the leading spirit behind the anti-chartering movement, encouraging banks to basically encouraging governments, excuse me, to get rid of the chartering system. They were very big also in the general incorporation movement, which was to remove the chartering process, not just for banks, but for infrastructure companies, manufacturing businesses businesses, et cetera, these general incorporation laws, making it so if you want to start a corporation, you don't have to get a license from the government. These really do come from the Jacksonians, and that's something very important. That's something that's still with us, okay? So that was kind of uh, the Jacksonians on the state level. Uh, as a side point, interestingly enough, it's not really laissez-faire, um, but the Jacksonians did always fight 
to restrict banks' abilities to um, uh, print small notes, so notes of a small denomination. They basically argue that these were the notes your average person would hold and when banks suspended specie payments, which was against the law in many uh, states, but the states always sort of conveniently refused to enforce that law, uh, requiring banks to honor the redemptions, the Jacksonians felt that the poor would be the most swindled by this. So they were always pushing for this, and it deserves... Uh, so mention that this was an Adam Smith proposal. This is something Adam Smith had, had argued for. Adam Smith was not really perfect on uh, laissez-faire, uh, and banking was a particularly no notorious example of this. But he did have this policy that the Jacksonians also tried to enforce um, on the state level. So the Jacksonians were really devoted to trying to remove um, government privileges to fractional reserve banks uh, on the federal and state level. And so we've, we've talked a lot about the theory and, and a lot of the, the politics behind it. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what was the real life economic environment going on during this time? Because, you know, you, you mentioned how um, inflation did go up. You know, there, there, there were aspects to this, um, you, know, you know, while they're, they're navigating these sort of waters, you know, there, 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 there was an increase in bank notes and things like that. Can you just talk a little bit about the real life impact of this on the ground that might have you know, in, in, in some influence in politics down the road? Yeah, so the a lot sometimes people argue that okay, Jackson more or less got rid of the Second Bank of the United States in 1833 when he removed the government's deposits from the bank. So the bank still had uh it, it sort of lived its continued its uh it's it's it eked out its 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 existence. It was still a private bank chartered by Pennsylvania, et cetera, at least after it lost its federal charter. Um, and they say, well, you saw a tremendous increase in uh, the money supply and in prices after this. So this is very clearly, well, the wildcat banking gone wrong. This is why you need a central bank to provide, you know, the wise stewardship over the economy and to regulate the issuance. Uh, of of fractures reserve banks. In reality, as uh, uh, economic historians such as Peter Temin uh, many decades ago pointed out, uh, this increase in the money supply was due to an increase, a tremendous increase in uh, specie in the country. Um, <laughs> I always think it's ironic. I, I, I think it's very ironic because I've always mentioned parallels with uh, Andrew Jackson and Donald Trump. And in this case, the increase in specie reserves uh, was related to politics and financial relations with China and Mexico. So it's just <laughs> kind of like this this weird. All of the stars are sort of quasi aligning here. I I I I, I don't. I, you know, it's it's it, it, it's 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 quite remarkable. Um, but anyway, so those reserves uh, went into the banking system, so banks could use them to increase their credit. Now the Jacksonians were pushing for higher reserve requirements. They weren't able to get that done. Um, to try, you know, which would have sterilized some of the increase in the money coming in into the country. But um, the, 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 the increase in the money supply would have occurred without the second, with or without the second bank of the United States, much like inflation would have occurred. Um, the increase in the money supply would have occurred during the war of 1812 because the government was going to print money uh, using a central bank or not using a central bank. So this uh, e this uh, increase in the money supply did fuel a business cycle, and it led to the panic of eighteen thirty uh, panic of eighteen thirty seven, which, similar to the panic of eighteen nineteen, kind of radicalized the Jacksonians even further, um, and they were able to push forward their monetary reform, particularly the independent treasury. By this time, Van Buren is president. He's probably one of my favorite presidents, if not my most favorite president, because uh, he practiced laissez-faire during the Panic of 1837, which is why the downturn was very mild. Uh, and he also pushed for this final uh, part of the Jacksonian uh, monetary program. All right, which was to separate the government from the banking system. Uh, and this was this great accomplishment. Though the Whigs repealed it a year later, uh, James K. Polk, he instituted it again, the Constitutional Treasury in 1846. So at long last, the Jacksonians had accomplished what they were looking for, which was a separation of the government from the banking system and a reduction in monetary cronyism. Well, there you go. So here we have a victory on the side of liberty versus power, thanks to the Jacksonians.
Uh, next week's show, we're going to go into some of the other battles going on during this time within the Jacksonian administration. But uh, and this is definitely, again, I, I, I think there's so much interesting stuff within this, this period of just understanding you know, political strategy, uh, uh, you know, what, what does a, a functioning republic really look like in practice? Um, and again, that, that intersection of, sh- of, of s- strong, sound economic analysis combined with political power. Um, again, I, it's, it's such a fascinating stuff. And, and again, I think that's one of the, my favorite parts of cronyism, which again, if you do not have a copy of the book, LVP at the Mises store gets you a little bit of a discount. Uh, any last words here, Patrick? Um, I would just say that uh, if you're interested in one section of the book to read, I would say this section on the bank war. That's really my one of my favorite sections. I think it's a great illustration of the Rothbard's, you know, liberty versus power framework. Uh, it's a great uh, illustration of how reform can actually be uh, accomplished and how you can actually uh, reduce cronyism and special privileges and that the Jacksonians are gravely misunderstood and that we need more people talking about them and promoting their laissez-faire accomplishments because they really were the most successful uh, promoters of laissez-faire and the free market in American history, uh, and I would say by far. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it here on the Liberty versus Power podcast. Until next time, this has been Tho Bishop, Patrick Newman. We'll see you next episode. Oh, geez. Oh, oh. Uh, Tommy, Tommy, what are you, what are you saying? <laughs>